Welcome to MICA's latest web-based offering, CSI Diagnosis. In other words, Cognitive Science investigates the diagnostic process. This interactive video program will examine how clinical decisions are made, drawing from the rapidly emerging field of cognitive psychology to maximize accurate, timely decisions, also reducing the liability associated with missed, delayed, or faulty diagnoses. During the course of our investigation, we will cover the following. Chapter 1, The Problem, Diagnostic Error Revealed. Chapter 2, The Means, Process of Clinical Reasoning. Chapter 3, The Motive, Cognitive Bias in Decision Making. Chapter 4, The Opportunity, Investigation Errors. Chapter 5, The Solution, a new way of thinking. Be honest. How many of you have been blindsided by an unexpected diagnosis? Thankfully, most of these are caught and remedied. But what about those that weren't? Jake, 35, presents to the After Hours Clinic complaining of headache and nausea. He describes the headache as similar to migraine attacks he had suffered some time ago, but a little worse. He is triaged as a migraine headache and is seen by the physician. Vital signs are normal and he has a normal neurologic exam. Treatment includes 10 milligrams of metoclopramide. Jake reports some relief of his nausea shortly afterwards. The headache has improved somewhat, but is not gone completely. He appears stoical and is anxious to get home to relieve a neighbor who is looking after his two-year-old child. Jake feels that things will settle down if he goes home and rests. He is discharged home with instructions to return if worsens. You probably know what's coming here, right? Back at his apartment, Jake's headache worsens and he calls his wife at work to ask her to come home. When she arrives, she finds him dead on the living room floor. Autopsy revealed that he had died of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. But misdiagnoses don't just happen in one setting or specialty. What about when... The 22-year-old with fibrocystic breasts that you so confidently reassured ends up having an aggressive cancer. The 12th case of epigastric pain this week was actually an MI. The radiologic abnormality so obvious when displayed in the courtroom seemed so innocuous 18 months before. The patient who you told pain and distension was normal after a lap coli that went like clockwork was later returned to surgery by the on-call surgeon who noted a lacerated bile duct. The overprotective mother, whose child had a runny nose and fever, was returned to the ER six hours later with meningitis. The elderly patient, whose medication side effects were treated as a new condition, with yet another prescription medication. Faced with exponential numbers of medical problems, not all decisions will be correct. And thankfully, most will not result in an untoward outcome. Some, however, will have serious consequences. Patients and families, believing the misdiagnosis denied them an optimum chance for recovery, have frequently sought redress through the legal process. Nationwide, allegations of misdiagnosis, delayed diagnosis, and failure to diagnose continue to share top rankings as the source of an escalating number of medical malpractice claims and contribute substantially to the medical liability crisis. No specialty is exempt from this dilemma. The Physician Insurers Association of America, PIAA, has been collecting medical malpractice claims data since 1985. According to the most recent cumulative data, Errors in diagnosis rank in the top three for causes of claim or suit representing millions of dollars paid. For example, 34% of claims for dermatologists involved diagnostic error and paid a total of $33 million. Likewise, 34% of emergency medicine claims paid over $100 million for these errors. Family practice also had an incidence of 34% for an imposing $491 million. 34% of internal medicine claims for an astonishing $645 million. 35% of pediatric claims involved diagnostic difficulties for a total of $176 million. 
and radiology had an incidence of 39% for diagnostic errors for a loss of $422 million. We should point out that it's not just medical specialties and subspecialties that are seeing these losses. 28% of allegations against cardiovascular surgeons involved misdiagnosis and cost a cumulative total of over $33 million. 37% of general surgery claims involved some diagnostic error for a loss of $230 million. 25% of plastic surgery claims and 35% of urologic surgery claims in suits also involved a failed diagnosis. In the recently released Health Grades Patient Safety in American Hospitals report, the category of failure to rescue accounted for 188,000 deaths from 2005 to 2007. These deaths were associated with a failure to recognize, diagnose, and treat post-surgical complications. In reality, when a diagnosis is missed, peers and patients alike are quick to jump in the fray. What was he thinking? Why didn't she see it? It was so obvious. Examined retrospectively, these cases demonstrate a thread of missteps in problem solving, which may not be the norm for a particular physician, but leads to disaster in a specific case. Historically, medical error was treated primarily with a systems approach, encouraging physicians to better manage paper flow, patient follow-up, and the like. However, more recently, systems failures, while still prevalent, have begun to be outpaced by claims attributed to the harder-to-quantify category of physician error in judgment. Also disturbing is the difficulty and expense in defending these suits. The Institute of Medicine and Health Grades reports have heightened public interest in medical error. Regardless of what you believe about the accuracy of their overall numbers, mistakes have been made. People have died. Change is necessary, but where do we begin? Cognitive errors, errors within the very fabric of medical decision making, are the thrust of this unique program. Distilled into three objectives, this program should enable you to differentiate common sources of error and standard approaches to clinical decision making, analyze examples of cognitive bias, and discuss the effect of each in the failure to make a correct or timely diagnosis. Examine steps which can be used to de-bias clinical reasoning to improve diagnostic accuracy. My name is Karen Connell. Joining me today for this important investigation are Michael Brennan, MD, Family Medicine, Walter Neary, MD, Internal Medicine and Geriatrics, Attorney Tom Bacher, and Judy Avery, my colleague from MICA's Risk Management Services. This program has important information for physicians of virtually every specialty, as well as other clinicians, including nurse practitioners and physician assistants who are involved in the diagnostic process. To begin, let's hear from Judy Avery and Tom Bacher about the overall problem of misdiagnosis and medical malpractice. Tom, I know you've been practicing for about 25 years and defending medical malpractice cases. And in the failure to diagnose cases you've defended, are you starting to see more cases where the uh, decision making, the physician thinking uh, plays a big role in their judgment? Absolutely. I think that for one thing, the time pressures physicians face these days uh, leads to uh, difficulties in thinking clearly sometimes. Um, and these cases are very tough to defend, as you know. Uh, the very name of the case, a misdiagnosis case, uh, implies that there's a diagnosis that should have been made. When you miss a free throw, that implies you should have made the free throw. Uh, and when you get into the courtroom, uh, it can be very difficult. It's not like reading a mystery novel where uh, you don't know who done it when it starts and you accumulate clues and you figure out by the end of the book who done it and uh, can look back and see what all the clues meant. When you try a case, it doesn't go that way. Uh, generally, there's an opening statement and what happens is the uh, plaintiff's attorney uh, talks all about the uh, uh, terrible death of the uh, deceased 
from a brain cancer and about uh, how six months before he was in the defendant's office, the defendant thought it was uh, sinusitis or migraine or whatever, and now he's dead and little Tommy and little uh, Sarah don't have a daddy anymore. Um, and it's like knowing the whodunit uh, before you start reading the novel. Uh, in retrospect, these clues always get to be glaringly obvious. Only a numbskull could have missed them. So the elephant in the room is actually that if things were done correctly, the patient wouldn't have died or wouldn't have been badly injured. Absolutely. And it's a big elephant and it's pink and it's got great big ears that help it fly. Okay. <laughs> As the literature demonstrates, Physicians have begun to look to the science that examines how people reason, formulate judgments, and make decisions. Science implies that cognitive errors may be predictable in some situations, not the result of ignorance or the acts of a few bad performers. Thus, the goal of the science, and of this program, is not to demonize or deny such errors in medical decision-making exist, but rather to understand how these mistakes typically occur in order to plan corrective action to avoid them. In this program, we will, as Jerome Groupman, MD, puts in his book, How Doctors Think, explore how heuristics serve as the foundation of all mature medical thinking, how they can save lives, but how they may also lead to grave errors in clinical decision-making. Importantly, the right shortcuts have to be employed at an optimal emotional temperature. The doctor has to be aware of which heuristics he's using and how his inner feelings may influence them.